The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Interprofessional Perspectives on Safety Management with Targeted Therapy for B-Cell Malignancies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ECV860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to Interprofessional Perspectives on Safety Management with Targeted Therapy for B-Cell Malignancies. I'm Dr. Anthony Mato from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and I'm pleased to welcome other panelists from Sloan Kettering, including uh, my pharmacy colleague, Dr. Amber King, my nurse practitioner colleague, uh, Ms. Kristen Battiato, and my colleague from cardio-oncology, Dr. Dipti Gupta. Today, are we going to explore the team-based management of adverse events arising from the use of targeted therapies in the B-cell cancer setting? An important topic because BTK and BCL2 inhibitors are among the standards of care in diseases such as CLL and MCL. During this program, we will periodically share several resources for AE recognition and management. You want to refer to these practice aids throughout our discussion, so please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. I'd also like to thank our collaborator partner, the CLL Society, who offer many valuable resources for professionals, patients, and caregivers. Okay, so we're gonna start by looking at um, the available options for patients as outlined from the NCCN guidelines and break it down into the treatment naive and relapse refractory setting. And I think what's really interesting and what's evolved in the NCCN guidelines is that you'll see across different categories, either frail patients or elderly patients or patients with comorbidities or younger patients or those with poor risk features like a deletion 17P, the options for patients with CLL in the frontline setting are largely the same. BTK inhibitor-based therapy with acalabrutinib plus or minus abinutuzumab, ibrutinib plus or minus an anti-CD20 antibody, or venetoclax with a venetuzumab. What's interesting over time is that we've seen this tremendous equalization of treatment options for younger and older patients, whereas before the best therapies were largely relegated for younger patients with favorable risk features. Similarly, in the relapse refractory setting for older or younger patients or those with comorbidities or poor risk features, we have those same categories, the BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and ibrutinib, Also, we have venetoclax as a monotherapy or in combination with rituximab. And then we have PI3K inhibitors, duvalisib or idelalisib with rituximab. In in mantle cell lymphoma, we have less options available for patients, unfortunately. But in the relapse refractory setting, we do have the BTK inhibitors as standards of care, including acalabrutinib, ibrutinib-based therapy, and zanubrutinib, and listed here from the, from the NCCN guidelines is also lenalidomide plus rituximab. Now you can see that BTK inhibitors are really approved across B-cell malignancies. And for example, I'll highlight ibrutinib, approved for CLL in the frontline and relapse refractory settings, mantle cell, marginal zone lymphoma in the relapse refractory setting, as well as approved for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And then we'll highlight the newest BTK inhibitor, which is a non-covalent inhibitor, pirtobrutinib or LOXO305, which is not approved uh, in any setting at this time, but is being studied across CLL, MCL, and other B-cell malignancies. This is the status of other targeted therapies um, for B-cell cancers. And you can see venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, is approved for CLL um, and is being studied in mantle cell lymphoma. Idelalisib is approved for CLL and is approved in other B-cell malignancies not listed. Duvalisib is approved for CLL. And umbralisib, a new PI3K inhibitor, is right now approved for marginal zone lymphoma and follicular lymphoma and not yet approved for CLL. Well, let's now highlight the major issues associated with the covalent BTK inhibitors, which include both um, toxicities or adverse events or resistance to these molecules. And by far and away, when you look across the clinical trials, you'll see that adverse events are the most common reason for discontinuation of agents like ibrutinib. And when we look um, at data from the frontline and relapse refractory settings, we see that discontinuation rates overall for this molecule, for example, range between 41 and 54%. And so toxicity is an area where we would really like to focus our time today because this is not only a great opportunity to help patients to stay on these drugs, 
by educating others on how to manage these particular events, but may be crucial in terms of understanding the AE profile and selecting the most appropriate agent for a particular patient. Well, let's start with the BTK inhibitors and try to highlight the spectrum of adverse events that one might expect with these particular agents. And this slide is really not specific to a particular drug, but broadly across the class. And you can see toxicities such as atrial fibrillation, arthralgia, infection, diarrhea, hypertension, and bleeding. And then there are other important toxicities we think about like dermatologic changes, rash, for example, fatigue, which in my experience is chronic over time, more serious arrhythmias like ventricular arrhythmias or certain cytopenias, which of course can lead to infection. And now let's talk a little bit about venetoclax and the, the constellation of adverse events that one might see with this agent. These uh, include myelosuppression, uh, which can lead to infections, GI toxicity such as diarrhea, and then of course tumor lysis syndrome, which can occur um, during the dose escalation phase of this particular agent particularly for patients with bulky disease who may be at high risk for this particular event. Now we'll highlight the safety experience with PI3K inhibitors. And I think when you, when you look at this slide, it just gives you a window into the, the, the toxicities that are unique to this particular class of agents. Uh, the way I like to think about it are you can see autoimmune phenomena, particularly um, hepatitis or hepatotoxicity, pneumonitis, and colitis. And it's interesting that there's a time component associated with these toxicities. Hepatotoxicity is generally an early event. Pneumonitis can occur at any time. And colitis, true autoimmune colitis, is generally a later event occurring between four and seven or eight months after the start of these particular agents. Despite what anybody tells you, all agents in this class are, um, pose a risk for these toxicities, albeit to a differing degree. You can also see uh, infectious complications, not only traditional bacterial infections, but also opportunistic infections across the class. Now we'll delve into case discussions on uh, the management of adverse events associated with targeted agents. And this is where I'm really happy to include our team from MSK, where we'll delve into some real life patients and try to determine the best way uh, to manage particular events. So I'm gonna start with a case um, of a, a patient, a real life case presentation uh, that Kristen is gonna help me with. Um, this is a 75 year old who meets the IWCLL criteria for um, treatment initiation for CLL. Very important to take a medical history uh, and a list of medications that, patient, that the patient is on. So this patient has hypertension uh, controlled on amlodipine. They have renal insufficiency, creatinine is 2.1. So their creatinine clearance is significantly diminished. And then they have molecular genetic testing to try to best characterize their prognosis from the perspective of their CLL. FISH shows a deletion 11Q in the absence of a deletion 17P. Next-gen sequencing does not show a TP53 abnormality, but does show a NOTCH1 mutation, and their IGHV unmutated. So in discussing the potential treatment options for this patient, a decision is made to initiate ibrutinib uh, monotherapy uh, at 420 milligrams per day. And this is a key moment in the management of a patient like this, because this is oftentimes when we're in clinic that uh, the nurse practitioner or the pharmacist provides counseling uh, to the patient. And so Kristen, do you wanna give me some comments about um, when you're interacting with a patient, what you might discuss with them uh, in terms of um, potential adverse events or um, guidance that you would give this particular patient what to look out for from a clinical perspective. And we might actually bring Amber in on this conversation as well. Sure, thank you, Anthony. So the first thing I'm gonna do is review with Mr. Thomas here, the importance of medication compliance and how to take the medication you know, every time at this, around the same time every day, single dose. Then I'm gonna also go over the signs and symptoms of certain AEs he can encounter while on a brutinib therapy. They can include anything from myalgias, arthralgias, skin rash, uh, new or worsening hypertension, early bruising or bleeding, um, or the development of an arrhythmia being atrial fibrillation or, an, or a ventricular arrhythmia. It's important to note his creatinine clearance or his creatinine here at 2.1. So you definitely want to avoid NSAIDs if he has any AEs he's trying to manage, such as arthralgias or myalgias. Um, it's also going to be important for him to understand what the symptoms are of an arrhythmia and that, and that he report it promptly. Another thing we're going to probably do is encourage him, if he hasn't already established care with a cardiologist, to go, in, go ahead and do that given his comorbidities. 
We likely monitor his labs weekly to assess for signs of tumor lysis, although rare, and, and organ toxicity as well. Amber, do you want to add anything here? Sure. No, I agree completely with Kristen. I think looking at sort of his profile, this is sort of a, a conventional patient we see in clinic. I think an important thing with his renal insufficiency is making sure that we talk about antihyperuricemics. Is this somebody we saw on allopurinol before we start a brutinib? I think the most essential thing at this stage is to do a nice and detailed medication review, um, highlighting supplements. A lot of these CLL patients take over-the-counter medications, um, green tea, ginseng, a lot of things that don't seem like the interactor could be problems, but can cause um, you know, high risk for bleeds and interactions, especially in an older patient like this. So now we get a little bit more information on this patient. As we um, stated earlier, um, this patient starts ibrutinib. They have a little bit of hypertension on amlodipine, no drug-drug interactions, but some renal dysfunction. And six months on therapy, of, of course, they don't walk in the door saying they have rapid onset AFib, but they're feeling palpitations, they're short of breath, they're not making it up the stairs. Um, and sometimes that triggers a call to a nurse or a nurse practitioner. Uh, at that point, you know, Kristen would uh, likely tell this patient to come in, to get an EKG, to have an exam, so on and so forth. And the patient is discovered to have a uh, blood pressure of 145 over 80, which is actually a good thing in the setting of rapid AFib. At least they have a blood pressure uh, that's um, a good value and a ventricular rate of 130, and the um, ECG confirms atrial fibrillation. So now we're going to go into the, um, the nuances for how to manage this patient, but I'll throw this out to everybody before I go on to the next slide. Uh, any comments here about what to do? Maybe Dipti, do you wanna just off the cuff give a comment? Yeah, sure. So typically in a patient's journey in on BTK inhibitors, this would be the time where either um, uh, cardiology or cardio-oncology would be consulted, depending on your practice setting, it could be either or. Um, but this is exactly where you would need expert uh, opinion on how to manage this patient moving forward. And there are some, you know, there are three aspects that are very key, even in a sort of uncomplicated rapid AFib, which is what, let's say, what Thomas has right now. Number one, whether we're going to do rate control versus rhythm control. Um, number two, whether or not this patient needs to be on anticoagulation and to simultaneously discuss then the bleeding risk. And number three, whether or not we would be able to continue ibrutinib without um, you know, dose reduction or, or we need to temporarily hold it. Amber, question for you. Um, we're not, we're very lucky that we have, um, we're very lucky that we have um, cardio-oncologists at MSK, but you know, honestly, most centers aren't, aren't, don't have cardio-oncology departments. Um, and their patient, the patient will likely follow up with a locally car local cardiologist. So the question I have for you is, um, what do you, what are your concerns in terms of drug drug interactions when we send a patient to a cardiologist who happens to be on ibrutinib, or are there any contraindications for starting any particular anticoagulants? Certainly, ibrutinib, you know, as most tyrosine kinase inhibitors is a substrate of uh, 3A4. It also actually inhibits um, P glycoprotein or PGP. So there's a myriad of interactions, um, especially with using some narrow therapeutic index drugs, which for elderly patients for AFib, things like digoxin are a concern where it's very important to have a collaborative relationship with your cardiologist to make sure that before they start the patient on anything that they sort of clear the medication list. Um, DOACs are kind of a, a great and novel therapy that we use, but they also can have some you know, dynamic interactions by causing excess bleeding risk, but also inherently have some pharmacokinetic interaction with the brutinib. So I think DOAX, um, digoxin, um, and then also beta blockers like corvetolol sort of have um, interactions that really should be triaged before the patient starts. And Kristen, last question before I uh, pass the baton to Dipti, who's going to give us a really a great commentary on the cardiac toxicities associated with these meds. Uh, you know, I'm presenting the cases if this patient called me with AFib, you want to really speak to the nurse or the nurse practitioner's role in this, because oftentimes nursing is on the front lines. And if they are not educated about how to pick up the subtle 
nuances of these toxicities, I think they could often be missed until it's too late. Yeah, so anytime a patient uh, co complains of worsening shortness of breath or any anytime there's a change in their clinical status, um, you definitely want them to come in and, and for an evaluation. He definitely obviously needs an EKG um, and even some imaging possibly, but the first step we're gonna do is throw an EKG on him and, and see um, if he has an arrhythmia. It's really important for nurses to kind of tease this out and make sure that he gets care um, immediately and that this and and let the patient know how serious of, a, of an issue this is at the time and it can't wait. That's really vital. Well, with that being said, I'm going to ask Dipti if she can educate all of us about cardiotoxicities uh, associated with ibrutinib and other BTK inhibitors. So take it away. Thank you, Anthony. So let's go over the CV side effects of BTK inhibitors. Um, most of the data that I'm going to present um, comes from ibrutinib. Um, Anthony is going to discuss a little bit more about what's happening with the second generation BTK inhibitors and their cardiotoxicity profile as we move further in the presentation. Um, so primarily one thing that has sort of been the bane of cardiology and cardio-oncology as far as BTK inhibitors is con are concerned is atrial fibrillation and atrial arrhythmias. Um, and this is a frequent problem. Um, you know, it causes cardiac morbidity and it does lead to either temporarily holding or even sometimes dose reduction or discontinuing of ibrutinib and BTK inhibitors. So it's definitely problematic. And this is one of the most frequent um, sort of side effects of ibrutinib. Um, the second thing that is also very, very frequent, and I would like to say that this is sort of underappreciated because of how ubiquitous hypertension has now become um, with you know, TKIs, et cetera, is the fact that this is, an extremely important problem. It's relatively easy to handle, not just by cardiology, cardio-oncology, even by primary care providers, and in some cases, even in oncology practices. And one thing to keep in mind about hypertension is that it actually potentiates bad cardiac outcomes down the stream, including atrial fibrillation. Um, and vice versa, if you treat hypertension, it actually mitigates uh, downstream cardiac risk. So really, really important to pay attention to just simple blood pressure control. Uh, there's an increased risk of bleeding. I'll talk a little bit more about why that is with BTK inhibitors. And of course, when we talk about atrial fibrillation, you know, in the very same sentence, we have to then address uh, primary or secondary prevention of stroke, um, which is done by anticoagulation. And so we have to sort of then um, discuss the risk and benefit and also try to pick out the right agents for these patients. Lastly, and importantly, is ventricular arrhythmias. Now, this is an infrequent problem, thankfully. However, it's really important to understand that even though um, malignant ventricular arrhythmias occur in less than 1% of the patients, this can be um, somewhat unexpected in the sense that these patients may have no structural heart disease, no ischemia, and no QT prolongation, and then have um, a malignant arrhythmia, which can lead to sudden cardiac death. So something that thankfully is not frequent, but something that absolutely needs to be in our di differential if a patient is reporting syncope and you know, um, you're seeing a lot of PVCs on EKG and things of that nature. So let's talk a little bit about hypertension with ibrutinib. Um, this was a retrospective study published in blood in 2019 of over um, 500 patients. They were followed for two and a half years and almost 80% of these patients developed new or worsening hypertension. A third of these patients had grade three, four hypertension, which means um, that the blood pressure range was over 160, over 100. Uh, during therapy with ibrutinib, there was more than a 10 millimeter rise in systolic um, from baseline, and again, in over 80% of the patients, and a 50 millimeter mercury increase in over 10%. Uh, New or worsening hypertension was associated with threefold increase in major cardiovascular events. And like I said, there was a 40% um, uh, mitigation of risk if you were to do a good job treating this hypertension. Let's now look at 
atrial fibrillation with ibrutinib. So atrial fibrillation and cancer, unfortunately, even though we know a lot about atrial fibrillation in the general population, we don't have um, high quality data about atrial fibrillation in cancer patients. However, what we do know is that when a cancer patient develops new onset atrial fibrillation, their risk of systemic thromboembolism is two times greater than the, if they did not have cancer, and their risk of heart failure is of the order of five times higher. There's also increased bleeding risk, not just by virtue of saying that ibrutinib causes cytopenias or it causes platelet dysfunction, but cancer is a prothrombotic condition. So, um, so there is bleeding risk. Um, again, like I said, these are not well studied, unfortunately. The incidence of atrial fibrillation with ibrutinib varies from 4 to 16 percent. And the reason there is such a big variation in this number is because there is vari variation in follow up periods and in screening methods in almost all the trials. The highest incidence is within the first six months. Um, and there, you know, if, if a patient was treated with non ibrutinib treatments such as venetoclax for B cell malignancies, the risk of developing atrial fibrillation with ibrutinib would be ninefold higher. Their bleeding risk would be threefold higher. So, so definitely very, very impressive um, numbers here. In terms of mechanism, um, both on target, off target effects, uh, we don't really know exact mechanism, but BTK and TAC expression is increased in atrial tissue isolated from patients in AF undergoing cardiac surgery as compared with those in sinus rhythm. They probably have something to do with pathways during cardiac stress. And so um, uh, in vivo, it has definitely shown that if you were to inhibit this, um, then it increases arrhythmogenicity. Risk factors, male gender, older age, valvular heart disease, and hypertension at the time of CLL diagnosis. Um, in terms of clinical course, ibrutinib can be continued in more than half these patients, and most of the atrial fibrillation is actually less than grade three. Um, which is really great news. But again, it's patients like Thomas that present, but if they are able to get triaged and managed quickly, chances are that you're able to continue BDK inhibitors without any problems. Management, as we've talked about, can be challenging due to bleeding diathesis. And as Dr. King mentioned before, also drug-drug interactions. And th these are twofold. Number one, ibrutinib affects platelet function and inhibits the P -glyco glycoprotein transporter and is primarily metabolized by the hepatocytochrome cytochrome P450 system. So as you have so many inducers and inhibitors of the P450 system, that there are umpteen number of interactions that have to be really accounted for when you're trying to uh, treat these patients. For example, amiodarone and calcium channel blockers can increase the brutinib serum level six to ninefold. Um, if you are, were, were to use digoxin um, for someone, say, with soft blood pressures or a second or third agent, again, you have to remember that because of the P-glycoprotein substrate effect of digoxin, it can lead to increased digoxin levels. So we have to account for that. So a simple algorithm for managing ibrutinib-associated atrial fibrillation um, and it has been um, already put out. Again, the, these are not robust guidelines. Um, however, this is a simple clinical algorithm that really helps us understand and manage these patients. And this was published in Jackie e. P. in 2018 and will be in your syllabus. Um, it's, as long as your patient is hemodynamically stable, um, you want to really screen the patient. You want to establish a diagnosis. You want to make sure there's no thyroid, metabolic, comorbidities, et cetera, PE, sepsis, nothing like that is happening. And if, if all of that has been ruled out, you want to just simply proceed with weight control strategy. Um, when will you consider a rhythm control strategy with cardioversion or with heavy duty antiarrhythmic medications only when you have a hemodynamically unstable patient? Um, and assess suitability for anticoagulation. We have traditional risk scores that are available, um, such as CHADS2 score or CHADS-VAS score. Um, please use those. You want to make sure that you've had a very um, 
thorough conversation about bleeding risk, prior bleeding events. You've checked their counts, made sure they're not thrombocytopenic, hemoglobin, iron, et cetera, okay. And then if they do need primary uh, anticoagulation for prevention of thromboembolism, then you will choose an agent um, very, very carefully. If it's warfarin, again, we don't use warfarin, generally speaking, um, in this cohort, unless there is a compelling reason to low molecular weight heparin, again, you have to make sure creatinine clearance, et cetera, is okay. Um, you can use factor 10 A inhibitors. In fact, those are our go-to. You have to be cautious, again, about drug-drug interactions. Um, most of them are very, very well tolerated. You will avoid direct thrombin inhibitors, which is dabigatron, because this can lead to very high dabigatron levels. So rate control strategy, rhythm control strategy, hemodynamically unstable, we go to rhythm control strategy and hemodynamically stable, we wanna stick with the rate control strategy. Um, you wanna use beta blockers as first line agents here. Again, um, you know they do not have as severe interactions and are safer in the grand scheme of things compared to calcium channel blockers because of again, cytochrome P450 effects, they increase ibrutinib level. If you must use them, then you have to talk to your pharmacist, you have to talk to the hematologist, you have to talk about dose reduction of ibrutinib in that setting. Um, again, we like to avoid digoxin, uh, push comes to shove, you absolutely must use digoxin for rate control. You have to at least give it six hours before or after. And again, you would add digoxin at a lower dose here. Um, you will monitor very, very carefully about the joxin uh, toxicity. Um, and if beta blockers are working, you will continue beta blockers. Of course, if there is refractory or symptomatic AFib, they fail the beta blockers, um, we might then need to add either calcium channel blockers or joxin or move altogether to the rhythm control strategy. Amber, could I ask you a question? Uh, just something out of curiosity here. Recently, uh, I've had a few protocol patients start on BTK inhibitors who were prohibited to be on carvedilol. I didn't quite realize that that was a weak SIP inhibitor, but is that a medicine we should be avoiding uh, in terms of drug-drug interactions? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm hitting you up on the spot here with this question, but um, it's inhibited my, my ability to use certain drugs as of late. Sure, I think a carvedilol, at least for me, is one of the more understated interacting medications. It's more of a substrate of 2D6, which with the TKIs tends to not cross. The issue is really P glycoprotein and it's an inhibitor. So mostly it's sort of BCL2 based therapy such as metaclax becomes a problem because you have to empirically dose reduce. So I think it's definitely something where if you could avoid it, um, it'd, be, it'd be best. Mentorpolol is a lot cleaner, but it's something that's a little less um, tough to deal with than diltiazem or verapamil, which as Dr. Gupta mentioned has you know, 3A4 and PGP inhibition where you really have to look at um, adjusting the dose and sometimes it's really sort of tough to use it if you're also adding things like a pixaban or rivaroxaban on top of that. Thanks, that was really helpful. Okay, uh, so this is our case that we presented earlier. Just so you remember, this is a 75-year-old um, patient with CLL who started ibrutinib monotherapy in the frontline setting and six months on therapy developed a rapid onset atrial fibrillation. And so I wanted to um, have a uh, Dipti and Amber just provide some additional commentary here on uh, now that Kristen's taken the call, she's brought the patient in and diagnosed atrial fibrillation. Can you provide some uh, comments on how we should manage this patient in real time? And uh, particularly, uh, I know there's not a lot of data for, for this question, but whether or not the ibrutinib should be held and whether or not that makes a difference. Sure. So I can go first. So one of the things here that was done for Thomas, thanks to our team efforts, was that AFib was confirmed on ECG. And I cannot emphasize this enough, how important it is to confirm an arrhythmia, whether that be by event monitoring or by ECG or long-term, short-term loop monitoring. Um, and the reason I say that is, um, you know, in the recent in the in the recent past, there has been. Um, this whole wave of Apple watches and you name it, and there's all kinds of devices that patients are wearing. Um, and they often, these devices will send alerts, including atrial fibrillation to patients. 
And that is not, you know, of course that should trigger further workup, but that is not to substitute an ECG or a monitor done in a doctor's office. So that's number one important point for us to remember. Number two, um, again, um, we don't wanna have blinders on. Um, these are sick patients, these are cancer patients. Um, you know, they may or may not have thyroid dysfunction, structural heart disease, heart failure, ischemia, metabolic abnormalities, sleep apnea. So you have to do good doctoring here to make sure that ibrutinib is not just, um, you, uh, it's not only ibrutinib that you've sort of ruled out other things um, that could either potentiate or lead to atrial fibrillation. And we talked about beta blockers, a very important point from, from Amber and Anthony, this whole um, conversation about preferred metoprolol over Coreg. I will say that in AFib, we generally start with metoprolol, it's a better, um, agent for rate control. When we're talking more about cardiomyopathy here, we're talking about blood pressure control. That's when we want the additional alpha blockade. So then we go to the non-selective agents such as Coreg, Libetalol, et cetera. Um, primary prevention of CVA. We talked about this a little bit. Use CHAD score, CHAD's VASC. Um, in case of Thomas, this was 4% per year, which makes it makes him intermediate risk. Um, and the recommendation is to consider full dose um, anticoagulation, therapeutic anticoagulation. We go over the risks and benefits, we look at his counts, um, and then we consider um, a newer agent, whether that be rivaroxaban or apixaban. Again, we talked about this before, please try to avoid dabigetran if at all possible. Um, and in, in this case, he's got a perfusing blood pressure, he's got some mild symptoms. Um, there's no reason that we're not able to just control him with first line treatment and continue ibrutinib without holding it or even dose reducing it. Remember for non-hematologic AEs, you do want a grade three or higher AE to occur before you start thinking about modification of BDK inhibitor therapy. Can, can and, you remind us, can you just remind us what a grade three AFib event looks like in terms of so, versus a lower grade event? Yeah, so a grade three AFib um, would mean symptomatic despite medical treatment and, and not optimally controlled. So let's say I'm trying beta blockers as first line, he gets a little bit better, but then his blood pressure drops, I have to take him to the ICU. And then finally we take, you know, we've tried second line digoxin and we fail there now starting to go into heart failure. Um, and at this point, we've sort of exhausted what we needed to do. And now we want to ablate his AV node and you know, do a pacemaker or something. And there's a device coming into picture now. So that's what grade three looks like. Grade four is of course, life-threatening. And again, sort of the data says that more than 50% of AFib is going to be less than grade three, right? Which kind of makes sense because most people we see are like the case that we're talking about. So they will not even meet that sort of threshold for us to, to really do much with ibrutinib. I mean, that said, a lot of times when patients are hospitalized, their you know, ibrutinib will get held by virtue of the fact that they're in the hospital. But um, strictly speaking, that is not um, something where I will call Anthony and be like, no, we need to get him off ibrutinib for good. Amber, did you wanna add anything here um, at this point in terms of the, the management from your perspective? Yeah, sure. And I completely agree with Dr. Gupta, especially being really cognizant of drug interactions. I will also add that for someone like this, who's, who's older and has some renal insufficiency, things like apixaban may be slightly prioritized over rivaroxaban, um, just because of the data. He's 75, has some renal insufficiency. So there may be a little bit more safety with apixaban. And also one thing that I think a lot of providers, not only, you know, cardi cardiologists and NPs and, and such that work in oncology, but um, holding the abrutinib before any sort of procedures or interventions is important. We always tell people if you're on a DOAC, if you have any sort of tooth extractions or any sort of you know, procedures that you have to hold that. But I find a lot of times that we get calls from dental offices that they have to perform a procedure and the person's on abrutinib and they're just really not sure what that means. So always thinking about the additional incremental risk that putting someone like this who definitely warrants anticoagulation, um, thinking about the baseline risk that abrutinib presents and really counseling the patient and really getting the word out to say, hey, let your other providers know that you're on not only this you know, anticoagulant, but also a brutinib, which effectively acts 
like an anticoagulant because um, I've seen a lot of people that have had procedures and the, they just don't realize that itself also is similar to the blood thinner that they're on. L last question. This is kind of a segue to the next section. Kristen's come to me recently with a couple of patients who were on ibrutinib and had hypertension or had some other cardiac event. And the patients were um, somewhat insistent that if we switched them to a more selective BTK inhibitor, that that would essentially remove the risk of that event. Any comment on cardiac specific events and um, switching from one class to another once that event has actually happened? I'll, I'll throw that out to anyone who wants to tackle it. So for example, if I'm on, if I have ibrutinib and I have hypertension, can I, you know, what can I tell them about the risk of such an event occurring if I switch them to ACALA or the same for AFib or the same for any ventricular arrhythmia? So I can start, Anthony, and my take is this, um, and I'll be interested to see what your viewpoint on this is. I just had a very interesting patient and I had this exact same conversation two days ago, which is that Maybe it was our patient. <laughs> <laughs> and so because, you know, ICALA is more selective in the second generation, you know, there's there are more selective agents in general. Yes, um, they are safer from a cardiotoxicity profile standpoint. There is no doubt that they're safer. However, the residual risk with agents such as ICALA and, and its, you know, cousins and neighbors is still high enough that I don't know that I'm going to make much headway by switching them from ibrutinib to a calibrutinib. That said, for patients that have more cardiac comorbidities at baseline, there can be a case to be made to start a cala up front if you know, the cancer outcomes um, are equally efficacious. Um, so I think that's where there may be, you know, something where I, I would get on board with instead of sort of switching patients that have poorly tolerated ibrutinib to acalabrutinib. I'd be very interested in the team's sort of take on this. Once you've already had the event, I'm not really sure that you can guarantee a patient any risk reduction in yes. hypertension or AFib risk or, or recurrent AFib risk. So I've you know, for certain events, I think the the value of switching within the class is much lower from a risk benefit perspective. So I, I have not tended to do that. But what I have done is what you suggested is I think overall the risk is lower. And so I've switched more to the more selective inhibitors from the start rather than this class switching uh, at the time of an event, particularly a, a serious event like, like atrial fibrillation. But I, with that being said, I should probably move on to the next segment because here we are, the more selective BTK inhibitors. Um, looking at the kinome maps, clearly they have more uh, or fewer rather off-target effects. There's more selective for BTK, less um, selective for other um, off-target effects. And whether or not that differentiates their AE profile is really the, the topic of the next section of the presentation. And so here we see inhibition of off-target kinases with BTK inhibitors can lead to toxicity. And we've talked a little bit already about the bleeding, well, not a little bit, we've talked a lot about the bleeding and cardiac uh, toxicity uh, and whether or not that's off-target due to tech inhibition. We haven't spoken a lot about rash, diarrhea, or arthralgias, but that may be more so related to EGFR. Um, this is the data that um, Dipti um, recently uh, mentioned, the atrial fib, a flutter risk for acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib. This is the Elevate RR trial, which is a randomized trial in the relapsed refractory setting of these two drugs, head-to-head -head comparison in a relatively high-risk patient population, those with the deletion 11Q or deletion 17P. And what we were able to get from this data set were a couple different things. Number one, I'm not really speaking about efficacy today, but hazard ratio was one. So the drugs were equally efficacious with a non-inferior endpoint. But let's focus here more so on the toxicity profile and what's highlighted in red, red is the risk of AFib or A-flutter, 9.4% with ACALA versus 16% with ibrutinib. And those were statistically significantly different from one another. Um, and there was a, it was even more pronounced in patients, you see in the bottom of the slide, who... Um, did not have a prior history of a fib or a flutter. So this is truly the incident events. 
was 6.2% versus 14.9% um, with the acalabrutinib. There's also um, data coming from this trial, even though these weren't really the, you know, the primary endpoints, were to look at other um, adverse events and for comparison, and the hypertension data and the bleeding data were striking to me, particularly for the any grade events, were 9.4% with the acala versus 23.2% with the ibrutinib, and then bleeding events 38% any grade versus 51.3% um, with the ibrutinib. Although if you look at the grade three or greater events um, for bleeding, they were pretty similar, 3.8% versus 4.6% and major bleeding events uh, were similar as well between the two drugs. So it seemed like the lower grade bleeding events were higher with ibrutinib. Then switching gears, this is the Alpine trial. So this is another trial, head-to-head -head comparison of zanubrutinib versus ibrutinib in the relapse refractory setting. Uh, a couple of differences between this trial and the Elevate RR trial. Number one, the follow-up is different, so it's a lot shorter here. Um, and the patient populations are somewhat different. This is not a restrict. This is not a 17p 11q restricted patient population, but just as all comers with relapsed refractory disease. This is one of those interesting time to event analyses, and this one is for AFib. And I think this is really telling. Uh, and we would see similar data with the ACALA um, data set. Big difference in the incidence of AFib: 2.5 percent versus 10 percent. The p-value is 0 0.0014, and so these were also statistically significantly different for atrial fibrillation. Um, now we're switching gears again, and this is to the Bruin trial. So this is the, you know, the ultimate cross-trial comparison across now three different trials. Bruin, keep in mind, is the data for LOXO305 or pirtabrutinib. This is a non-randomized trial, so here there is no comparator but this is a large, uh, greater than 400 patient population uh, treated with LOXO305. And the, the interesting thing is that we didn't see a whole lot of the BTK specific toxicities with relatively shorter follow-up. Here you see the incidence of any grade atrial fibrillation was about 1%. Uh, at our center, we've treated, I think more than hundred patients with this agent so far. And I, there's hardly been a patient where we've suspected arrhythmia. So it does seem to be pretty well tolerated from a cardiovascular perspective. You can see the uh, any grade hypertension data was 5%. So now this is for the whole panel. We'll talk about some uh, questions here. So um, first of all, what are the safety implications of the evidence? So number one, um, now we're doing this head-to-head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head -to -head comparison of ibrutinib, acala, zanu, and then we've also included pirtobrutinib. Um, I throw this out to anyone who wants to tackle it first. How do the cardiovascular safety evidence from these comparisons really inform treatment selection? I think I'll go last because I've already made up my mind as how these data will influence me, but I'm curious to throw this out to to anyone. Maybe we'll start with Kristen this time. Kristen, you see a lot of patients on your own um, independently. You see patients who come to you and say, hey, I'm sick. I need to start a BTK inhibitor. You, we often have a, a conversation about what we would choose together, but how do these data influence what you would do? Are, are you going to lean more towards the earlier generation ibrutinib, or are you leaning more towards the next generation agents based on these data? Uh, based on the data, to be honest, I'm going to lean towards more towards the second generation BTK inhibitor, um, probably a calibrutinib, especially if the patients are older and have more com comorbidities. So these data convinced you to change your practice? Yes. Um, as Dr. Gupta said, you know, once there is an event, there's not much um, benefit to switching uh, agents, but if we can uh, prevent an event, um, even better. So I would, I would tend to favor a calibrutinib at this time. Okay, and to Dipti, we have a lot of sophisticated patients who not only want Kristen to weigh in and me to weigh in, but they want you to weigh in before they make a decision. Um, if a patient is thinking about BTK inhibitor-based therapy, they want we send them to you specifically to help them decide what to do. Uh, how are these data impacting your recommendation? Um, so they're definitely safer, but they're not you know, they're not toxicity free as far as the cardiovascular side effects are, are, um, are concerned. 
And so a patient with comorbidities, if they're equally efficacious and, you know, you can talk about cost effectiveness, you can talk about duration of therapy, you can talk about their total tolerability. If all of those things are, you know, the same or better with second generation, then of course go with second generation. That's, that's my take on it. But then again, the patients that, that, you know, come to me sometimes can be very, very high risk and, you know, um, in that case, I would definitely favor a second generation BTK inhibitor therapy, all thing, all, all other things, um, cons- uh, if they are the same. And Amber, we often um, partner with you or your colleagues at MSK to have you go into the room really on the front lines and educate the patients about the AE profiles of all of these drugs. How would, you know, if we have a patient who's trying to make a decision, um, how would you, um, or how, how do these data sort of impact your teaching style with patients, um, particularly when they haven't yet decided what they're going to do or they're seeking several opinions and they've heard, you know, one agent or another from different um, consultants? Certainly. No, I think, um, as everybody had said, this, the emergence of data, especially directly comparing them, because before we just sort of had incidents from their isolated standalone trials, which is helpful, but very hard. But now we have data comparing um, uh, brutinib to second generations. And, you know, as everybody said, it's clear that from a cardiovascular perspective, that the second generations are certainly safer. So I think it's basically what other comorbidities the patient has, um, compliance wise, because when we look at the second generations and even uh, when we talk about pirobrutinib, you know, we have things that are once daily versus twice daily, um, interaction profile, what other things they can and cannot use. But I certainly think that it, it's going to be tailored to the patient, what their insurance approves. But as everyone said, you know, with all the, the head-to-head comparisons, it, it's looking very clear that the second generations are uh, the safest. And then also, you know, when we have the approval of pirobrutinib, that's also going to be another conversation. So looking at those subsequent head-to-head trials is really going to tease out the nuances from a cardiovascular perspective, but all the subsequent toxicities we'll talk about during the rest of the presentation. Thank you. So we've spent a lot of time talking about BTK inhibitors, but this patient uh, would have also been a candidate for venetoclax-based therapy. And I would like um, Kristen and Amber to just briefly outline um, their thoughts about the AE profile of this BCL2 inhibitor uh, and provide some helpful tips. Thanks, Anthony. So for the first thing I'm going to do with Mr. Thomas is I'm going to assess his risk for tumor lysis. This can be done with labs and CT imaging. Um, As we know, any lymph node greater than 10 centimeters or a lymph node uh, greater than 5 centimeters and an absolute lymphocyte count greater than 25,000 places a patient at high risk. Also, a creatinine clearance less than 80 can, will do that as well. If a patient is high risk, you want to strongly consider admitting them to the hospital for at least for the first two weeks of the venetoclax ramp up for more invasive tumor lysis monitoring. Um, as Amber mentioned before, the brutinib, you're going to premedicate with an anti um, hyperuricemic agent such as allopurinol and ensure they, um, ensure they can adequately hydrate. Um, it's also important for patients to know the, the extensive ramp up schedule and make sure they can be compliant with it. Myelosuppression is something we see also with venetoclax therapy, particularly neutropenia. Febrile neutropenia is rare, but neutropenia itself is something we encounter pretty frequently. If it's, gra- it's, a, if it's worse than grade three, we can consider a brief hold and support the patient with GCSF and with and close lab monitoring. Infections are common as well. They're most likely going to be upper respiratory, but if there's any sign of an, of an active infection, you want to consider holding until resolution. GI events can include diarrhea and nausea. For diarrhea, you want to first rule out infectious causes, and then you can treat with Imodium. For for nausea, I often have my patients premedicate with an antiemetic 30 minutes prior to dosing. Once the the venetoclax ramp up is completed, um, you can even consider moving dosing to bedtime, which has helped compliance with our patients. Amber, would you um, focus the conversation here on drug-drug interactions? Again, your area of expertise um, when we're going through that med list, and of course, it's pretty important to make sure it's accurate before we ask you to take a look at it. Can you just give some guidance about um, how we should approach um, venetoclax and uh, drug-drug interactions? Absolutely. No, so I think, you know, prior to starting therapy, uh, getting an accurate list of medications that they take and ensure to, to, you know, directly probe the patient and say, this includes any supplements or herbals or OTCs, because 
I can't tell you how many times those are omitted because they don't consider them prescriptions, but they're just as nefarious in the terms of interactions as some of the prescription drugs are. So once you do that, I think the next step is to tell the patient to always carry that list with them. Um, if they do experience side effects of Metaclax and they get admitted, whether it's to us or locally, it's always important for those brothers to know what they're on, what ramp up schedule they are at, um, and sort of where they're going. So I think the most integral thing for Metaclax is making sure that there's no major interactions during the ramp up. For example, for strong 3A4 inhibitors, they cannot be used during the ramp up until the patient's at a safe target dose. So especially making sure if there's any fungal history or any sort of major inhibitors on board, those need to be washed out or a new therapy needs to be selected. And then again, bringing in sort of the 3A4 inhibitors, like for Thomas, if he ends up on diltiazem or verapamil or carvedilol, it's important to work with him and say, you know, the cardiologists say we can't get off that agent. It's like, okay, we'll have to just dose reduce the venoclax and carefully counsel them on how to take the, the pills because there's nothing more dangerous than concentration changes for metaclax during the ramp up period. And then lastly, for inducers, these are fortunately rare. I think a thing like St. John's warts over the counter is, is troublesome. And then patients with seizure disorders, they're often on inducers. So really tough to dose this with metaclax. So you really wanna work with your local provider to sort of get them off this therapy and then um, uh, start them on metaclax you know, as soon as feasible. Just as a reminder, please download the AE Management Practice A detailing safety recommendations with venetoclax. I also wanted to highlight um, some information about the CLL Society. This is an excellent um, resource for professionals, patients, and caregivers. Um, we would encourage um, patients and caregivers to visit the CLL Society uh, page at CLLsociety.org. Um, really, really interesting educational pieces there. We've all participated in the videos and in their newsletter and newspaper uh, and lots of programs that are very useful uh, to patients and practitioners. So check out the website. I think it is of uh, tremendous value. Uh, and then the CLL Society is pleased to offer a patient education toolkit. Uh, I use some of these in my practice already um, to pro provide standardized uh, information for patients. So uh, think about using that and uh, you can download it or order it at that particular um, uh, link that's included as part of the slides. Now we'll delve into a completely separate but related disorder, mantle cell lymphoma, uh, which is another B cell malignancy where interestingly, several of the same therapies that are applicable for patients with CLL are also uh, quite active uh, in mantle cell. So this is Ellen, a uh, patient with mantle cell who's relapsing after chemoimmunotherapy. She had um, R, uh, maxi RCHOP with cytarabine etoposide and then an autotransplant, very standard approach for mantle cell and unfortunately uh, not thought to be given with curative intent, pre presents now with anemia, fatigue, and imaging that shows diffuse adenopathy. Um, and of course, we want to confirm what's going on. So it has recurrent mantle cell, P67 of 25%, uh, CCND1 translocation 1114. And so now um, we're thinking about what to choose for this patient. The patient um, is given a brutinib. Note here the dose is 560 milligrams per day. There's difference in the FDA approved dose for CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, I guess we'll talk a little bit about whether the higher dose leads to more adverse events. Um, and the patient is treated, um, but one year into therapy presents with grade two arthralgia. And so a new side effect that we haven't highlighted um, earlier in the presentation now emerges, and this is arthralgia. So um, we wanna talk a little bit about how we can manage this problem because it does come up a lot when we're giving patients BTK inhibitors. And I would spread, I would, I would also include myalgias and arthralgias uh, and gouty flares as sort of three of the similar problems that we encounter. Um, this is a great area where the nurse practitioner and the pharmacist can really work together to develop a management plan, um, including use of medications um, like uh, NSAIDs or acetaminophen. Um, prednisone could be even be a potential option at lower doses and then potential dose reductions. I guess I'll editorialize here and say that while we try all of these things, I'm not convinced that there is any one standard approach for managing arthralgias or myalgias associated with BTK inhibitors and every one of these interventions, if we had the time, uh, Amber could uh, weigh in on the risks of 
chronic NSAIDs or long-term steroids. Um, and so certainly it's a trial and error approach. Uh, Kristen or Amber, outside of commenting that this is a difficult problem to manage, anything specific, any data-driven approaches that you have? Um, if, if significant enough without, and the patient doesn't have any relief, you, you can always consider a brief hold or um, brief drug vacation, though we try and kind of navigate with these, for, with these, um, uh, with this pathway first before holding drug, obviously. Yeah. Amber? I agree. I think, you know, with the, the, these type of patients, they're often heavily pre-treated with conventional chemotherapy. Some have been through transplant. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, not uncommon for them to require um, a holiday and even sometimes you might have to go down uh, a dose level um, for these just considering um, they're slightly different than a lot of the CLL patients these days that we put on BTK inhibitors. So what if Ellen had received acalabrutinib? Uh, if you remember back to the beginning of the presentation, uh, acala, Xanu, and ibrutinib are all approved in mantle cells, so we have three options available. So let's say this patient started acala twice daily. Now, um, after they start the medication, they're presenting with different toxicities. So um, GI toxicity, we see some grade two diarrhea and headache. Um, interestingly, usually these happen a little bit earlier on in the course, but they can certainly happen at any time point. And so now again, um, back to Kristen and Amber, some, let's just start with the headache. I think that's probably easier to tackle initially. Any tips for how we would manage um, the acalabrutinib associated headache, which by the way, we don't have a mechanism of action for yeah, Anthony, um, it's actually quite common, like you said, in the first four to six weeks of therapy, but can, but can occur at any time. Uh, we, we first reach for NSAIDs if the renal function can tolerate it, um, acetaminophen, um, but we often tell patients to increase their caffeine consumption. Sometimes an extra cup of coffee or two a day can make a big difference. Um, it, and if really severe, we can even uh, reach for ca uh, caffeinated tablets, but I haven't had to do that that often. Like I said, usually after the, fir the first four to six weeks of therapy, uh, patients settle into the drug and they do okay on it. Um, in regards to diarrhea, um, we wanna obviously make sure it's not infectious, um, and, but, once, um, but once that's ruled out, we can go ahead and give uh, Imodium or even Lamotil if severe enough as well. Amber, anything to add um, for either situation? No, I agree. I think a lot of times I rarely get pulled in for a calibrutinib headache and GI disturbances because they happen early and they tend to be manageable with a lot of these, um, you know, lower level interventions that don't require, um, you know, dose cessation. Unlike it's, you know, older, older um, cousin, uh, abrutinib, where the GI side effects can be a little bit more difficult to manage and require some interruptions and reduction. So I completely agree with what uh, Kristen recommended. And then finally, um, the third BTK inhibitor approved for this disease is xanabrutinib and um, has a different AE profile. And neutropenia has been highlighted as being a little bit more common um, with this agent. And so um, this patient develops, uh, let's say, grade three neutropenia. And so um, can we get some commentary? And I think this is not really specific to Xanu, but this is any BTK inhibitor where neutropenia occurs uh, how should we manage that? Um, yeah, so the min so when we, we detect any kind of neutropenia, if it's grade three or worse, we're going to consider a brief hold and support the patient with growth factor with close lab follow-up. Once the neutropenia resolves to grade one or, or less, we can go ahead and restart. Um, it's a, if it's a recurrent issue, we can even consider a, do um, a dose reduction, though we try not to do that. Amber, anything more to add? Yeah, I agree with Chris, and I think of the, the BTK profile, I think xanabrutinib, at least from the data that we have, which was mostly, um, you know, the, the lymphoma patients or that, um, it tends to probably cause the most neutropenia. And so I think holding it, dose cessation, but um, the, cap, the tablet sizes are pretty flexible. They come in 80s. And so if it is a recurrent theme, then it, there's a little bit more flexibility to sort of um, adjust the dose. And I think at any step, I always ask the patient, are you taking anything new? or sort of any new medications to make sure there's no new interactions that weren't accounted for the first time that we started the medication. This is a cross-trial comparison uh, in relapse refractory mantle cell for a patient that's treated with ibrutinib, acala, or xanubrutinib, uh, just to get a sense of the AE profile and whether or not it leads to discontinuation. 
and ibrutinib discontinuation rate due to AE was 7%, Acala 6%, Sanubrutinib 9.3%. To my eyes, uh, pretty similar, um, although you can see, uh, again, with the all the caveats of a cross-trial comparison, there are some differences in the AEs that lead to discontinuation. Uh, comorbidities and safety can inform the choice of a BTK inhibitor. And here, I don't think we need to go into tremendous detail because we covered this in the CLL portion, but I think um, both Amber and Dipti would agree that if a patient has underlying hypertension or atrial fibrillation, or um, you know, severe neutropenia as a component of their disease, it might influence choosing one agent over another. Um, did you guys want to comment on that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Anthony. So patient is baseline hypertensive, has pre-existing AFib, older patient with structural heart disease definitely would favor a second generation agent, all other things equal. And of course, I guess their current medications would also, Amber, influence a little bit about which agent we choose. I mean, it's not covered here, but certainly proton pump inhibitors might stray you away, well, would stray you away from acalabrutinib. Any others that we would think about to help distinguish choice of one agent over another? I think minus the acalabrutinib and the um, acid-dependent absorption, um, as far as interactions, anabrutinib uh, and abrutinib seem to be overall somewhat level. Um, I do think that with the new data, as far as like post-marketing follow-up, abrutinib does have more flexibility in dosing, especially with the new 70 milligram tablet than it did prior, but absolutely baseline medications, especially those that maybe need to manage the cardiac condition should be considered and the flexibility of actually doing those adjustments well and leaving room for sort of dose level reductions beyond one, maybe even two or three. So here's our summary of BTK inhibitor safety monitoring approaches. Uh, don't give them concomitantly with warfarin. Uh, if we didn't explicitly say that during the talk, we're saying it now. Uh, for new onset AFib, consider uh, non-warfarin anticoagulation and monitoring. Uh, that was already highlighted. In the setting of hypertension, manage with antihypertensives. Of course, it's not just that simple, but certainly which class you choose is important. Monitor for and manage cardiac arrhythmia or AFib and treat appropriately. Monitor patients for signs of bleeding. Uh, if headaches occur uh, with acalabrutinib, it's usually an early event. Manage that with acetaminophen and caffeine. If neutropenia occurs, that may be more common with zanubrutinib. Uh, certainly monitor for that use of growth factors. Monitor for infection. Consider dose interruptions and dose holds. And of course, with any of these agents, monitor for infections and secondary malignancies. Amber, do you want to give a final uh, overview of the drug-drug interactions that we need to remember here? Absolutely. I think the, the cytochrome of the day is 3A4. So I always tell people, assume that it has an interaction until proven otherwise, because the chances are it probably does. And then again, the nuance with a calibrutinib is really that sort of um, acid-dependent absorption. And so if your patient has a history of Barrett's or any sort of other GI disorder, it's almost, it's nearly, it's impossible to have them on a concomitant PPI. And also the H2RA dosing is difficult because you're often limited to one day, once daily. So I think uh, three or four in, uh, screening for interactions, making sure there's no other supplements on board. And then again, avoiding a calibrutinib in those people that really depend on proton, proton pump inhibitor therapy. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, this concludes our exploration of team-based safety management. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. On behalf of myself and all of my colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, we wanted to thank you for your participation, and we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ECV 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Beijing Limited, Lilly, and Pharmacyclics LLC, an AbbVie company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education and the CLL Society.